So that if you were 14 years old, it might began. You must even be able to remember the beginning of the war. Well, yes, I do. I was just starting high school that year, 1914, the year the World War began. Uncle Fred, you always say the World War, not World War I. <laughs> it's an old habit, I guess. You see, it wasn't World War I until we had World War II. Well, let's see. In 1914, the Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated. That set it off, right? Well, that was only the incident that set it off. I think you'd understand the whole thing better if we talked about the background first. Well, I suppose so. It seems like a long time ago. Hey, I'm not that old. <laughs> but you know, it really isn't a long time ago as far as history goes. Still, the America I knew in 1914 wasn't the same as the America you know today. Let's start with that. We were more of a rural nation then. Lots of people on the farms. Mechanization hadn't come to the farms, but it was on the way. In the country, autos were few and far between. But in our cities, automobiles were beginning to compete with horse-drawn wagons. We had no radio, no TV. The news of our changing world came mostly from newspapers. We read about the new cars at home and about events farther from home. The possibility of a war in Mexico seemed more real to us than problems in Europe. We followed politics, the activities of President Woodrow Wilson, for instance. We were interested in news of our technical progress, too. The airplanes that flew 100 miles an hour. Submarines able to travel underwater. Ocean liners maintained our ties to the world, especially to Europe. Then, too, as today, immigrants were escaping from the troubles of Europe to make a new start in America. Well, do you think immigrants in 1914 left Europe because they saw a war coming? No, I doubt it. Then the war came as a surprise. Well, yes and no. There were some warnings that went back to about 1870. 1870? Yes. You see, when I was in high school, the most recent European war we studied was the uh, Franco-Prussian War. In this short, bitter struggle, Prussia beat France badly in 1870. Prussia emerged as the leader of the German states. In 1871, at Versailles, the German Empire was proclaimed under the dynamic guidance of the German Chancellor Bismarck. Germans were elated with the efficiency of the German armies, but the rest of Europe was worried by this new and frankly militaristic power. Between 1870 and the early 1900s, Germany grew in importance, a strong, thriving nation. And Germany continued to maintain large armies, which worried Europe. All her able-bodied men had universal military training. The German Emperor, Wilhelm II, was often seen in uniform in company with his general staff officers. Some felt that these professional military men were the real rulers of Germany. Was Germany the only militaristic nation then? No. In other nations, too, militarism was also strong. Russia had universal military training. So had Austria-Hungary. So had France. French staff generals talked incessantly of using their army for revenge on Germany for the defeat of 1870. England kept only a tiny standing army, and this was largely ornamental. However, England did maintain a great navy, the world's largest fleet, to defend her home islands and her vast colonial empire overseas. In the years between 1870 and 1914, Great Britain was the home of a vigorous empire. The other great powers of Europe were older empires, Austria-Hungary, Turkey, and giant Russia. Germany was a new aggressive empire. Even Republican France was expanding her colonial empire, mostly in Africa. 
Between 1870 and 1914, European powers were seizing large territories in Africa. Huge areas went to France and to England. At last, Germany too entered the race for colonies. This was imperialism, empire building. The struggle for colonies in Africa wasn't a main cause of the war, but it was part of the fierce competition between European nations. I can't quite see what African colonies had to do with it. Well, it was all part of the national rivalries that were building up. The great powers were jockeying for position. After 1900, for instance, England found that the German Navy was being trained. And so on the sea and on the land, the great arms race was on. In my boyhood, war was still glamorous and exciting. I hope we've learned better now. We must keep our nation strong, people said. Militarism. We must defend our national honor, they said. Nationalism. But nationalism wasn't all parades and show, was it? No, there was a serious side, too. There were national groups in Europe who yearned for independence. There were trouble spots where nationalistic uprisings could provoke war. For example, Alsace-Lorraine, once owned by France, now by Germany. Bosnia-Herzegovina, ruled by Austria-Hungary, where people wanted Serbian rule. And Poland, much of it ruled by Russia, where the Poles wanted an independent Poland. There were other trouble spots. Didn't anyone try to solve these problems? Oh, yes. At The Hague in Holland, for instance, governments met, much as they do in the United Nations today. Delegates tried to maintain peace and reduce armaments. Sometimes they did help to ease the crises that arose. Crises like the clashes between Germany and France in Morocco between 1905 and 1911. Then there were two small Balkan wars in 1912 and 1913 in which Serbia and her allies tried to push the Turks from Europe. The Balkan Wars were watched with alarm by Austria-Hungary and with interest by Russia. On the other hand, some of the great powers put on public displays of friendship which foretold new alignments. The President of France, Ramon Poincaré, the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, and the King of England, George V, were in a general agreement popularly called the Triple Entente. Meanwhile, Germany began to feel encircled by potential enemies. She sought to strengthen her own alliances with Austria-Hungary and Italy. This became known as the Triple Alliance. So by 1914, Europe was divided into two great armed camps, the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance, both tensely watching the Balkans. For one thing, Germany wanted to build a railroad from Berlin through the Balkans to Baghdad in the Middle East. Russia wanted an outlet on the Black Sea through the Straits of the Bosporus, controlled by Russia's old enemy, Turkey. So, Germany wanted a railroad, Russia wanted a Black Sea outlet, and Serbia wanted to unite all the South Slavic peoples into one nation. So there were conflicting interests in this Balkan area. This was the powder keg of Europe. When Colonel House returned from Europe and reported to President Wilson in 1914, he said, everybody's nerves are tense. It only needs a spark to set the whole thing off. A spark. Sarajevo was that spark, right? That's right. But you see, I wanted to tell you a bit about the background so that you'd understand why a spark could set off a great war. And it all began with an event in this little town in the Balkans. The date was June 28, 1914. Many people thought the assassination of Ferdinand, heir to the Austrian throne, would set off another small Balkan war. You didn't think it would grow into a big, long war? Not immediately. The next move was up to Austria. What would old Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria, do? The Austrian ultimatum sent to Serbia was impossible for Serbia to accept. Almost immediately, Russia backed Serbia, her ally, and the Russian Tsar Nicholas announced that Russian troops would defend Serbia. 
Russia would go to war with Austria-Hungary if she attacked Serbia. Tsar Nicholas had the support of the French president, Poincaré, who declared that France would honor her alliance with Russia in case war came. Sir Edward Grey of England tried to promote arbitration to stave off disaster. But Germany backed Austria. Kaiser Wilhelm said that Germany would help her ally Austria-Hungary, though at the last moment he did try to restrain the Austrians. The final decision remained Franz Josephs. The whole world watched him. Then on July 28, 1914, war was declared by Austria. Austrian troops marched southward into Serbia. Mobilization began. In Russia, in France, in Germany. World War I had started. But the roaring cannon and the fighting men were far away from America. We thought it wouldn't directly involve us. Then, in 1914, we thought it couldn't last more than six months. I was a boy of 14 when it started, and a young man of 18 before it was over. And what about your brother Frank? Well, he was older than I. Eventually, he did have to go. But in 1914, we never dreamed that millions of men would be involved, and that Americans would be fighting in Europe, too. But that's another chapter, the story of the conflict itself. <laughs>